Gresham College presents David and Goliath, Strength and Power in Sport by Professor John D. Barrow. Well, welcome to this second lecture uh, in the series about maths and sport. The great thing about today's talk about strength and power is that it also doubles as a sort of applied Christmas talk, showing you, uh, you can think of it as strength and power in Christmas shopping. Well, the first uh, topics I'm going to talk about are going to involve gravity in some way. And it's as well to get straight at the beginning something that can be uh, confusing to the outsider because in everyday life, people who talk about weight are not usually talking about weight. Uh, they may be talking about mass, and sometimes uh, when they think they're talking about mass, they're talking about weight. Uh, what's the definition of mass? And how is it distinguished from weight? Well, there are two definitions you could adopt uh, for mass. Uh, so you might, following the spirit of Newton's second law, that if you apply uh, a force to a body, then if it's mass, you're going to call m, some quality uh, m, then the acceleration uh, that it experiences uh, is given by uh, force is mass times acceleration. So this type of mass, which conventionally was always called inertial mass, uh, you could define as being the ratio of uh, the applied force to the object divided by the acceleration that results. And let's for the moment just call that little m. But, uh, so that is the definition of mass. Now, weight is something different. Weight is a force, and it's the fourth force with which the Earth attracts that mass. Now, technically, that might be a different thing to the mass that you define in this way. And so we use a capital M. So if we have an object here, the force with which it's attracted towards the center of the Earth uh, would be given by this little formula here. So sometimes this is called the gravitational mass. And it might, in principle, be a different thing. So if we combine these two things, you see that uh, we have now a simple formula that tells us that the acceleration that this or any other object would experience when you let it go in the Earth's gravitational field uh, looks like the acceleration due to gravity, this thing that we call little g, uh, times the ratio of these two types of mass. Now if these were different, so if for this pointer, uh, big M uh, was, say, twice little m, sort of absurd situation, and for another object it was sort of a half little m, then when you drop them in the Earth's gravitational field, they would fall with different accelerations. So you can see that if these two types of mass are really identical, that they're equal, then the acceleration with which something falls in the Earth's gravitational field is always the same. So that's an interesting feature because it means that you could carry out a high-precision experiment to test whether these two sorts of mass are really the same. And that's been done for some time. I think first in the 1960s, uh, mid-1960s, this was generally the most accurate experiment in physics that there was around. And this is a measure of the accuracy. If you were to measure the difference in these two sorts of mass divided by uh, the sum then this relative difference is less than 10 to the minus 12, one part in a trillion. So a trillion was a number we didn't come across recently until we started looking at the counts of the Italian uh, government, but I see it sort of sprung into the literature. So a trillion is a thousand billion, uh, or a million million. Now in Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today, uh, it's necessarily the case that these two sorts of mass are identically the same. So his theory of gravitation exploits this apparent similarity, makes it exactly the same. And here's a little picture. If you had two objects where the gravitational mass was the same, so you put them on a balance, gravity is pulling them towards the Earth, they're perfectly in balance, but if their inertial masses were different, when you accelerated this balance upwards, uh, the scales would tilt because one of them would respond differently 
to acceleration. So that's just a little introduction about what we mean by weight. Weight is a force, uh, the force with which uh, mass, quantity of matter, is attracted towards the centre of the Earth or a small object locally towards the ground. Well, let's have a look at gravity and your position on the Earth's surface. Now, if you hold a spring balance up, so a hook with a spring with a mass on the bottom, then that object will measure the force with which that mass is attracted uh, towards the centre of the Earth. But in practice, there's another force at work here because the Earth is spinning once on its axis every day. So if you're located at this point here, this latitude here, close to us up here, then if you stand on the Earth's surface, what do you feel? You feel two forces. There's the force of gravity, which is the pull of all the mass inside you, uh, roughly towards the centre of the Earth. But because the Earth is spinning, you're going round in a circle, and a force has to be supplied to make you move in a circle. But if you do move in a circle, you'll feel the reaction of that force pushing you outwards. So like when the bus goes round the corner, you all fall towards the side, away from the centre of the arc that the bus is moving in. Now what matters about that circle is what's the radius of the circle. And you can see that if you were down at the equator, the radius would be equal to the radius of the Earth. But if you were to walk up to the North Pole, then you're not going round in a circle anymore. So when you're located at some latitude here, you feel the resultant of these two forces, the force of gravity towards the centre of the Earth and this circular, or sometimes called centrifugal force, uh, pointing at right angles to the line through the north and the south poles. And that force uh, upon you is equal to your mass times the radius of the circle you're moving in times the square of the angular velocity, one rotation per day, uh, of the Earth. Now, the interesting thing about this, you can see, is that therefore the effective force of gravity that you feel uh, is affected by this rotation. If you're up at the North Pole, there's no effect of it at all because you're moving in a circle that has zero radius. But if you're down at the equator, you'll feel the biggest repulsive force away from the centre of the Earth that it's possible to feel. And so what this means is that if you hold up your spring balance, which measures the resultant of those two forces on us at this latitude, that you will feel the largest pull towards the centre of the Earth when you're at the North Pole or at the South Pole, and you'll feel the smallest pull when you're at the equator, when you're moving in the largest circle. So the force due to gravity, if you like, the effective value of this little g, uh, that's about 9.8 metres per square second, acceleration due to gravity, varies with location on the Earth because of the Earth's rotation. And so if you have a mass, capital M, its weight will be less at the equator, measured by a spring balance, than it will be at the poles. So uh, if you work out uh, one rotation per day, use the radius of the Earth and so forth, you're looking at an effect of about uh, half of 1% as you go between the poles and the equator. So about 500 grams in 100 kilogram of mass. So if you're a weightlifter, uh, you know, it's clear, uh, or a jumper, uh, there are better places than others in which to perform or to try and set records. So weightlifting is an obvious case. Uh, you want mg to be as small as possible. But if you're a jumper or a thrower, then you're interested, uh, for example, in throwing or long jumping, what's the maximum range that you can achieve? Uh, if you launch yourself with some speed v. And anything that happens with gravity where you convert some motion at speed v uh, into potential energy, distance up or distance along, this is always the telltale quantity. It's the quantity with dimensions of a length that you can make out of speed and acceleration due to gravity. So the maximum horizontal range for a long jump which you took off at 45 degrees, 
which no real long jumper is able to do at top speed, simply not strong enough. Uh, the range is V squared over G. So the smaller the acceleration due to gravity, the further you will go. If you're jumping upwards, half mv squared in kinetic energy converted into mgh, then the vertical height that you will reach, your centre of gravity will reach, is v squared over g. So you can see any type of jumping, uh, throwing for distance, is always uh, inversely proportional to little g. So uh, that's the first effect that's going to make you gravitate, as it were, it's probably a good word, to places where the acceleration due to gravity is smaller. There's another effect that shouldn't be ignored as well, that the Earth is not perfectly spherical. So in some places where uh, Mexico City, for example, you're at least a couple of thousand metres above sea level, you're a good deal further from the centre of the Earth than you are on the banks of the Dead Sea. So uh, if you are far from the centre of the Earth, then you will feel a lower force of gravity, smaller acceleration due to gravity, than if you're closer to the centre. So uh, if this is your weight, then the gravitational force is given by the mass of the Earth times your mass times Newton's constant divided by the square of the distance from the centre of the Earth. So as that distance goes up, uh, your acceleration due to gravity gets diminished. So you can see there's a sort of double whammy here, that if you could locate yourself at a place that is quite close to the equator, so the rotation repulsively counters the pull of gravity, uh, and you're also fairly far from the centre of the Earth, you're going to see an exceptionally smaller acceleration due to gravity and it's going to be easier to lift heavy things, uh, you will record a smaller weight when you stand on your bathroom scales and things like that. Well, Mexico City, as a sort of uh, infamous venue of this sort, uh, you're sort of 2,240 uh, metres above sea level, and you're relatively low latitude. So if you go there, the acceleration due to gravity is 9.779 metres per square second. So there, your 100 kilogram uh, mass weighs 977.9 newtons. If you look for the worst case scenario, you go up to as far uh, up into Scandinavia as people might locate major athletic uh, uh, events or even past Olympics, in the case of Helsinki, uh, Oslo or Helsinki, you've got an acceleration due to gravity 9.819. So this is the difference... Uh, about uh, four newtons or so in what the weight is of the 100 kilogram bar at those locations. There are other effects that I'm not going to go into today. If you're throwing things like the disc discus, you might even worry slightly about the rotation of the Earth. Well, the next type of problem involving power and weight and strength I want to say a little about is things to do with levers or leverage, a word which appears rather often in the newspapers these days, but it tends not to be about levers as we know them. You remember Archimedes boasted that if someone would give him a lever, uh, a long enough lever, then he would be able to move the earth. So the point about a lever, uh, the most important ingredient of it, is the product of a force that you might apply uh, here and then the distance from the point of application of that force to some fulcrum, some balance point. And the moment of this force here is the product uh, of the force times uh, the distance to the fulcrum. So what Archimedes was implying was that, of course, if you made that distance great enough, then the moment would be extremely large and you might move a load here that was a hundred times the mass uh, of one here by simply locating this one a hundred times farther from the fulcrum. So this is a bit like financial leverage as well. So the, the farther away you can get from the, uh, from the end point of the financial transaction sort of, uh, and from the regulators, the, the better... Uh, perhaps it is. 
Well, in mechanics and engineering, one's familiar with <coughs> the possibility of having three types of lever. So a lever has a balance point, a fulcrum, and there will be some load which is applied, uh, and you will then have to make some effort here in order to balance the load. So if this is one of your friends sitting at the end of the seesaw, uh, if you get on the seesaw at the other end, if you have the same uh, mass uh, and the same weight, uh, then if this distance is the same as this distance, you will be in balance. So this is a so-called class one lever where the load uh, and the balancing effort are on opposite sides of the fulcrum. So this is a common type of balancing situation. And this is actually the situation that you would encounter uh, in many sorts of sport. One example would be rowing, for example, where you're sitting uh, in your sliding seat, you are applying a force here, there is a fulcrum which is the row lock, and then you are applying your force to overcome the load which is the drag on the water. So you can probably think of uh, many other examples of this sort. The second type of lever uh, has both the load and the effort on one side of the fulcrum. So this one has the load closer to the fulcrum than the effort. So you can see therefore that you would have to, you would only need to apply uh, a smaller force as part of the effort because you're gaining from the large distance away. So you probably uh, do this type of class two leverage occasionally. Uh, if you go to the gym or you keep fit at home doing something like press-ups, this is a situation where the fulcrum are, are your feet on the ground, uh, the load is the weight of most of your body, uh, and then at the other end with your arms you apply uh, the effort uh, to push that part of your body up. If you raise your feet up and you put them on a stool, uh, then you will need rather more effort to push your body up, feeling a bigger component. If you're really ambitious and you do a handstand against the wall, then you would have to push your whole body weight uh, upwards against gravity, and it wouldn't really be a lever anymore. The third sort swaps the position uh, of these two. So it, this is you re need rather more effort uh, with this sort of lever. It's not the sort of lever that you might choose to use to be efficient. You might choose it in order to make life hard for yourself because you wanted to uh, get a better training effect, for example, if you were a, uh, a strength athlete. So in this case, the effort is closer to the fulcrum than the load. Uh, and so if the effort was just this was half the distance of the load, you would have to apply twice the effort as the value of the load in order to balance it. So a good example of this, if you're um, holding barbels or weights uh, and you just do curls like this, the effort that you're applying is to overcome the load that you're holding in your hands. Uh, the effort is closer to the fulcrum uh, uh, at your shoulder. So if you look around uh, sport, you will see uh, pretty much every activity involves leverage of some sort, whether it's running, whether it's cycling, whether it's throwing, whether it's jumping, uh, whether it's lifting things or gymnastics. Uh, and you can spend many happy hours uh, figuring out which of these varieties of lever, uh, maybe more than one sometimes, is coming into play uh, in different types of event. Even in running, okay, you are uh, using the end of your foot, the ball of your foot, rather like a, the fulcrum, uh, and you are driving through your foot to support your body weight and to propel yourself forward. Well, the classic and rather dramatic sport where uh, all sorts of levers seem to be uh, uh, on show at one time uh, is wrestling. Now, Olympic wrestling is not really like the wrestling that you know and love with giant haystacks and, and all those people in the great costumes. So forget all that. Um, uh, Olympic wrestling, and particularly Greco-Roman, where there's a restriction on what sort of moves you're allowed to use, uh, is a much slower uh, uh, affair. 
uh, and appears to require much more strength and a good deal more suppleness and uh, mobility. Uh, this is the most famous uh, American uh, wrestler, Carl Anderson, who was Olympic champion in 2004. Uh, I think his, his, his record when I last looked in collegiate wrestling was something like 169-0. So he'd never been defeated uh, in, in his career in, in the US. And you can see here that these two individuals, uh, they're each trying to apply a whole combination of uh, levers against one another. And in a sport like wrestling, those three varieties of lever are by no means all equally good or equally sought after. The best type of lever, as I said earlier, was the class two, where you're going to be able to get away with a lot more applied uh, force on your opponent by applying uh, a lesser force uh, at a distance which is greater than the impact on your opponent. So the class two lever is the best type of wrestling hold. The class three uh, is the next best. And uh, the boring old class one, like the seesaw, uh, is really the least effective and the least sought after. So if you're watching a sport like judo uh, or uh, wrestling, you can keep an eye out for these different types of lever and how uh, the fighters try to manipulate their opponent into a position where they can use their own body weight uh, against them to create one of these uh, leverages. Another amusing place where leverage is rather dramatic uh, is this one. So uh, rugby, much in the news recently, um, uh, if you watch the line out, uh, there's something rather dramatic. And when you start to put the numbers in, it becomes even more dramatic. So the fellow who's going to jump for the ball that's thrown in from the line out uh, is generally propelled into the air by uh, two of his gigantic colleagues. He's usually pretty gigantic as well. Uh, you can see a little force problem here. These two people are applying a force that's uh, probably a little bit bigger than their weight, really, upwards at this angle. So there's a force here, a sort of F cos of this angle, and this fellow here, F of cos of this angle. And what's opposing those two pushes is just the weight of this gentleman here. And what's striking about this is the height to which you can expect the jumping forward to go. So these people with their arms outstretched, this is up to at least two metres. So, so you, you might have uh, people here who are over two metres tall, even before they start stretching their arms out. Uh, and you're pushing this fellow up at least half his uh, body height, and then he's got an outstretched hand. You're looking at four and a half to five metres uh, at the top of the jump. So person throwing in the ball has got to time this rather precisely. The ball has got to come in at the peak of its trajectory there at just the right moment to reach the outstretched hand. This is a pretty alarming height to be pushed up to. So just for comparison, this is the world high jump record, okay, 2.45 metres. This is the world pole vault record, Sergei Bugpa, 6.14 metres. Uh, you'll win the Olympic Games probably with six metres, six metres and a bit uh, next year. Uh, you're not very far off that. Okay, it's a long way down. Well, the next little thing about strength and power that everybody always wants to know something about quantitatively uh, is in karate. Karate, unfortunately, is not an Olympic sport. It's tried and tried. Uh, to become an Olympic sport, and sometimes it, it reaches the last stages of the IOC um, elections, uh, but it never seems to get enough votes um, to become a full Olympic sport, uh, which is sad in a way, because there's a lot of uh, exponents uh, of the sport uh, the world over. It's an interesting question, what sport should be in the Olympic Games? So, uh, in the future, we've got uh, golf coming along, um, we've got football, we could probably do without, um, and so on. Um, I, I have a simple criterion for whether sport should be omitted or not, and that's simply to ask the question, uh, 
Is winning the Olympic Games the pinnacle of achievement in your sport? If the answer is no, then you shouldn't be in the Olympic Games. And that's quite a good criterion because it removes football, it removes golf, it removes tennis. Um, it's all the ones that you uh, might want to remove. And, and it wouldn't allow in Formula One, uh, <laughs> which I'm sure will be there soon. Um, well, you know what I'm talking about here. I'm not going to demonstrate it um, because I couldn't. Uh, so it's a sort of party piece of, um, of uh, karate black belts of having a stack of planks, for example, or a brick or bricks, and breaking them. Well, let's have a look at the numbers here. Um, the key to doing this, by the way, and why you and I, if we're not trained in this activity, don't do it, don't succeed, is because when we apply our blow, we sort of chicken out a bit at the end, and we decelerate, because we think we're going to hurt our hand. And, of course, you're decelerating at exactly the point where you should be accelerating. So you think you're applying a hard blow, but at the last moment you sort of, you sort of do that, as though you're swatting a fly. Uh, whereas the true exponent is really aiming the blow at a point that's lower than the impact point. And that ensures that the impact point is hit at maximum acceleration. Well, what would you need... Uh, to split a block of wood. And if you look carefully at what goes on in these demonstrations, you will notice that it's not one big block of wood, but lots of planks. So what you're doing here is not breaking a very, very thick block of wood, but bl sequentially breaking a lot of thinner planks. And that's much easier. To break a a plank like this, it doesn't matter too much what the area is, 20 by 30 centimetres, say. The thickness, uh, one centimetre, what you've got to do is to break through a, sh a slice of atomic bonds. Okay, so it's like you take a little slice here, you've got to sever a slice of atomic bonds. If you make the plank thicker, there are going to be more atomic bonds in that slice to break and you'll require more force. So for something that's made of wood, one centimetre thick, uh, you're looking at 3,100 newtons. For comparison, if you're sort of a typical person, you weigh 70 kilograms, for example, your weight is 686 newtons. Okay, so it's sort of five body weights, okay, to break that. If you had brick, Okay, same area, but a bit thicker, four times thicker. You'll need a little bit more, but brick's a bit more brittle than the, um, than the wood with its sort of fibrous uh, links. Now, a top karate exponent black belt will be able to bring in their hand at least seven metres per second <coughs> speed to hit the top plank. What's the mass of the arm that's moving at that speed? Well, 3.4, 3.5 kilograms, something like that. So it's not the whole body mass that's coming in at that speed. Okay, it's just the arm. So you can work out the momentum that is being transferred. It's the mass times the arm speed. Uh, and that's about 24 kilogram meter per second. So from that, we can work out what's the acceleration and therefore, what's the force that's being applied? Well, acceleration is really just uh, speed divided by time. So it goes from this speed, V, to zero when it hits the top in a very short space of time. So uh, the contact time with the wood at the top is just a few milliseconds. Okay, five milliseconds you'll see on film, typically. So you can estimate what's the acceleration that's involved with striking the top plank, it's MV divided by this time. Five milliseconds, 4,800 newtons. So this is easily enough to break this block or to break the brick. So it's not really even a challenge for a, a top karate exponent. Uh, he can put quite a number of planks here and follow through and break each one after the other.
And the key is this uh, high speed at impact and this very short time interval where the speed changes, and that's the acceleration. If you slow your arm as you come in to hit, it doesn't matter what speed you started at, you'll be hitting it at almost zero, and there won't be any acceleration at all, and you'll just hurt your hand. Needless to say, don't try this at home. Don't try it on your home. <laughs> well, I want to look at a different sort of uh, force now uh, that is created by rotation uh, in gymnastics. And there's a gymnastics exercise that's called the giant swing, and it's performed uh, by men, for example, on the high bar here. Uh, women don't do the high bar, they have asymmetric bars, they have a slightly different exercise. Um, but they can do swings of this sort on the asymmetric bars uh, and do. But I couldn't help mentioning, I mean, the term the giant swing means two things uh, in the world. One is as a gymnastic exercise, and the other, historically, is this fantastic object. People who've been to Bangkok will have seen this. Uh, it's called the giant swing. Uh, and this is 30 meters high, okay? It's a, an object that was used for a ceremony that goes back several hundred years. Uh, it's a Hindu ceremony which was to mark the success of the rice harvest. And what would happen would be people would attach themselves at the top here on long ropes and they would swing up as high as they could uh, and people would hold money and coins on very, very long bamboo poles higher and higher, some distance away, that they were supposed to grab. So this continued right to the 1930s. It was then discontinued because of a number of fatalities. Uh, and here are some old pictures I found. So this is a picture in 1910. Um, so you can see someone here who's, who's just swinging through the base. Uh, and then he's going to swing up the other side and try to grab things. Here are two people on a frame, uh, sort of a gondola, just getting going on a swing, and people have erected some of these poles here with things on for them to grab. So this looks pretty hairy. So you think this is um, 90 feet high, 30 metres or more. Well, let's get back to uh, safer pursuits in the gymnasium. So this is the sort of exercise that a male gymnast uh, would perform on, on this. And it's a sort of benchmark of a good gymnast, I think, if you uh, can do this exercise. I remember as a student going on a sort of athletics training course to Loughborough, and one of the people there was somebody called Angus McKenzie, who was a, who was a very remarkable young athlete. He was national long jump champion, hurdles champion, decathlon champion when he was a as a junior, uh, and he'd never been on a piece of gymnastic apparatus before, and uh, the sort of coach, I think it was George Gandhi, had asked somebody if they wanted to have a sort of feel of this bar, and, and Mackenzie went on it and did a giant swing immediately in the first time that he'd ever touched the apparatus, which rather staggered people who, who were in the gymnasium. So what I want to ask about this is, what's the force on you? As you go round, is this a dangerous exercise? Is it safe uh, for young gymnasts to do this sort of exercise? Well, you can see that there's two forces on you. It's the old story that we had of rotation and gravity when we looked at um, the motion of the Earth. But in this case, when you're at the bottom, say, you've got your weight acting downwards. But if you spin around... You're going around in a circle where this is the centre and the centre of gravity of your body will be about there. Go around in a circle and you'll feel a force pushing you outwards. So when you're at the top, you've got that force going upwards minus the force of gravity going down. But when you're at the bottom, you've got that force of gravity going down plus the centrifugal force going outwards. So the biggest force upon you is when you're at the bottom. It's like being on a roller coaster. Exactly the same. In fact, the mathematics is very, very similar. 
your head, fortunately, is moving in a smaller radius uh, circle. doesn't feel such a big stress as the rest of your body does. Well, let's have a look at uh, a setup. Let's even work out with some simple mathematics what the force is. So suppose you start like this at the top, or I picture you instantaneously when you're at the top. There's your centre of gravity, some distance h from your fingertips. And let's suppose you're spinning uh, at an angular speed, little w, when you're at the top. And then you drop down to the bottom, and you'll be spinning faster at the bottom. You gain this potential energy, and your angular speed at the bottom is big w. <coughs> so what we want to work out is what's the change in the energy from the top to the bottom, uh, and here are some formulas. So here's the same picture. Remember, little w at the top, big w at the bottom. And the rotational energy at the bottom is a half times the moment of inertia, times the angular speed squared. The energy at the top is a half i little w squared. And you've got potential energy uh, change because you go from this location to this location. Your center of gravity falls to h below the bar from h above. And so this is the change in the potential energy to mgh. The maximum force, as we saw, is obviously when the gymnast is at the bottom, feeling the weight plus the centrifugal force. So that's going to be the weight plus the rotational force at the bottom. And we just turn these around. We've got this formula here. The moment of inertia is a quantity that looks roughly like your mass times the square of the distance uh, from your centre, so your size squared. If you're a solid sphere, it's two-fifths uh, mh squared. If you're a hollow uh, shell, it's two-thirds mh squared, and so on. So this is the force that you feel at the bottom. It's your weight plus two factors determined by your inertia and your rotation. If at the top you started from a handstand, so you weren't actually moving, so you just dropped, that would be the smallest angular velocity that you could end up with at the bottom. You just cross off this term. If you look at film, like we saw of uh, this fellow here, you can actually count the number of times they go around, so you can see what the angular speed is. And it's about two to three revolutions per second uh, is the typical speed at the top. And the body size, about 1.3 metres. So what's the force on the gymnast? Well, it looks like the weight, okay, is a one. Here's the inertial factor, sort of four. And typically falling from the top, about 1.2, 6 mg. So it's like experiencing 6 g uh, at your centre. So this is quite a serious force. You wouldn't allow a roller coaster to be built which had the, uh, uh, the riders experiencing a force of that magnitude. And that's, of course, why roller coasters are not uh, semicircular. They have a slightly different teardrop st uh, shape to reduce the force on you at the bottom. If you started from a handstand, so you lose this term here, you'd only lose this term here. You'll be down to about 5g. The force on your head, okay, is a little smaller because your head is a much smaller distance away from your arms. So you could reduce this H factor here. Suppose you halved it. Uh, that would be rather dramatic. Um, so you would reduce this maybe to two or three. So your head, and therefore the blood supply to your brain, uh, is not being so seriously affected by those forces. But this is pretty much the same as the story for a, uh, a roller coaster. Of course, the velocities involved with the roller coaster are much greater because you're falling a very great distance uh, to build up speed. Okay, let's look at weightlifting. So this sort of little gentleman, uh, who's pretty much the strongest pound for pound person in the world, um, and he lifts about three times his body weight. I think he's barely about five foot tall. Okay, but pound for pound, he's the strongest uh, person.
person in the world, certainly the strongest weightlifter. With three Olympic gold medals, he would have had four, uh, but the fourth Olympiad he would have competed at, he'd changed nationality uh, and was not eligible to compete again. What I'd like to see is, can we understand the trends in the world weightlifting records? So weightlifting is categorized by weight. The weightlifting world is very statistics and uh, orientated. It tries to have very detailed formulae by which it can normalize the performances of lifters in all sorts of different weight categories, transfer them into points so that it can compare weightlifters in different categories to say who is the best, who is uh, the strongest pound for pound. Uh, well, uh, strength uh, is something that's not quite the same as size, it's not the same as mass, it's not the same as volume. And uh, we've had a little hint of this already. You remember when I talked about the karate black belt breaking the plank, what did you have to do to do that? You had to sever or slice through a little cross-sectional area of atomic bonds. So what determines strength is an area. If I'm holding uh, a bamboo stick here, as it were, that is a mile in length, I will not find it any harder or easier to break than if it is just six feet in length. Because I will have to achieve the same thing in both cases. I will have to split it and sever this little cross-section of atomic bonds. So in practice, strength is proportional to some uh, area-like quantity, proportional to size squared. If you look at two cats, it's a nice example. Uh, so this is the fully grown cat. Here is the kitten. Uh, what you notice is that the fully grown cat is not strong enough to support its tail. The tail always curves over. But the little kitten holds the tail bolt upright in a spike, it is strong enough to support its tail weight. So what's happened here is cats have the same body plan as they get bigger, they scale up in size. Uh, the volume of the cat has grown like R cubed, some size cubed, and the mass and therefore the weight grows in the same proportion. But the strength has grown more slowly as R squared. So the strength per unit weight, okay, goes like R squared over R cubed, goes like 1 over R. So the strength to weight ratio of these cats as they get bigger gets smaller. And the big cat is not strong enough to support the weight of its tail. You know this sort of thing probably from experience as well. When you were a child, you had no difficulty carrying another little child of the same mass as yourself on your back as a piggyback. You probably even took part in piggyback races at the school sports. But uh, if you try carrying another adult as a piggyback on your back, you will have much more difficulty. So uh, an ant can carry another ant on its back. A dog, little dog, can just about carry another dog on its back without any problem. A horse cannot carry another horse on its back. So what we see here is if you scale bodies up on the same plan, strength growing like size squared, weight growing like size cubed, therefore strength goes like weight to the two-thirds power. And if you tried to make giants bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger on the same plan, eventually they would break because their weight would get so great that it would be sufficient to break the molecular bonds uh, that hold their bones and their legs together. The same with skyscrapers. If you tried to have a skyscraper that was 10 miles high, okay, the force on the base would be so great, it would sever the molecular atomic bonds uh, and it would collapse. It would just sink into the Earth's surface by a plastic flow. Well, we're now in business to look at our um, uh, weightlifting world records because uh, the weight lifted is a measure of the strength. And the weight category that the lifter's in then tells us the weight. They're quite narrowly defined. Uh, so we could plot here 
we want to check this formula, okay, to see whether strength cubed is proportional to weight squared. So here is a log log plot. Uh, so three times the log of the strength would be a constant plus two times the log of the weight. So here's the cube of the weight lifted, okay, in cubic kilograms. And here's the square of the weight, kilogram squared of the weightlifter. And looking back a few years, these were uh, the world records a few years back, sort of snapshot. The straight line is this rule. So you see, we really are pretty good uh, in predicting and understanding what's going on. That uh, the reason the world record trends grow as they do is just a reflection of this simple formula. If you really wanted to take this seriously, uh, it's not very good when you get up to the very, very high uh, weights lifted and weights of lifter, because if the heaviest lifter really did lift what was required to be on this line, he's perilously close to breaking uh, his uh, cartilages, even his bones. You're putting enormous stress on yourself. So the very heaviest lifters tend to drop a bit below this line. And a rather more complicated formula is devised, uh, so Simpson's rule for weightlifters, which is used to normalise the performances to one scale. It's not based on physics or a rule like this at all. It's just based on statistics and fitting them by a handy formula. So what you can also tell from this picture is that the lifter who is most... Uh, above this line, to the left, is the strongest pound-for-pound pound lifter. The one who is most below it, uh, who's arguably uh, this one up here, a sort of world record, uh, or even this one down here, uh, these are the weakest. Exactly the same principles would be at work if you're looking at how strength determines performance in an event like the hammer or the shot put. Uh, where strength is going to determine uh, the launch speed of some projectile. So the same arguments work across different strength and power events. Well, let's look at one of those, uh, putting the shot. Um, this gentleman's the world record holder. Uh, the world records in these events uh, stem from a very, very long time ago. Um, in women's events, even more so. You probably notice if you follow uh, women's athletics at all, there are never any world records in women's athletics, okay, unless there are new events. Okay, a very large proportion of the world records in women's events were set in the 1980s. Uh, the major reason for that was that then rather stringent drug testing uh, came into play uh, for male growth hormone and, and other drugs. And... Uh, so athletes today are really competing against standards in the past that were unfairly set. And there is therefore an argument that's fervently put forward by some people that one ought to start again, um, certainly in women's athletics, with new records. Uh, but men's records in uh, the strength events suffer a little from the same problem. The world record here, 23 metres 12 uh, in the shot, uh, we want to try and understand, uh, in this event, how should you throw this shot in order to throw it as far as possible? Well, from what you know about projectiles, from what we said earlier on, you would have thought that uh, if you launch an object with some speed v at an angle theta, then what your lecturers teach you in mechanics uh, at school and then at university uh, is that the distance of flight, the range of this projectile, depends as the, on the sign of twice the launch angle. Well, a sign can never be bigger than one, uh, and it's equal to one uh, when uh, two theta is equal to 90 degrees. And so launching at 45 degrees is what gives you the maximum range. However, putting the shot's not quite as simple as that. Uh, there are two reasons why this is not the optimal angle to launch the shot at. The first, which you tend to see uh, sometimes in articles on maths and sport or in books about maths and sport, is that the 45-degree launch angle 
is the optimum angle, but only when you're launching from the ground and the shot then lands on the ground. But shot putters launch from about two meters above the ground, arm's length from a very large person generally. Uh, and in that case, the maximum range formula is rather different. So the range for a shot launched at a height h above the ground is given by the formula that we just saw with another correction factor here that depends on that height. So when the height is zero, this just looks like the previous formula. But uh, with a height of two meters, you're looking at an optimum range that's somewhere around 43-ish, 43 and a bit uh, degrees. So it's a small difference. And you might th have thought, well, that really solves that problem. The unfortunate thing is that if you look at shot putters, like a uh, friend here, uh, in detail and study how they throw things, uh, they do not launch the shot at uh, 45 degrees, okay? Uh, or even 42 or 43 degrees, okay? They launch the shot closer to about 37 degrees. And so you might wonder why on earth would that be? So why do they launch the shot at such a shallow angle? And the answer is that in these formulae for throwing projectiles some distance, we think of the initial velocity and the launch angle traditionally as being two completely separate independent things that we're at liberty uh, to set and achieve without worrying about how they're linked together. So you tend to think, well, our shot putter can throw uh, the shot at some speed v. Uh, how should he arrange theta? You know, what should he make the takeoff angle? And unfortunately, these are not independent. If we go into the uh, gymnasium and we study lots of shot putters uh, and measure the angle at which uh, they're launching the shot against the speed with which they can launch it, we'll find that there is a definite trend. So this is the lab data. And you can understand intuitively what's going on here that as you increase the angle at which you try to launch the shot, uh, the speed with which you can achieve, uh, that you can achieve, goes down. So as you try to apply a force with your arms at a different angle, uh, your strength really does vary as that angle alters. And that's what this is reflecting. And so if we uh, produce a simple formula to couple uh, our v to theta, and then we go back to the problem of the range, we're looking to maximize uh, the range subject to this constraint that links the speed and the angle together. So it's a constrained optimization problem. And if we look at some answers, there's not just one anymore. Here's the range, here's the angle which you uh, project at, and here are the solutions. And you can see that this, for example, here uh, is giving you an angle of about sort of 38, 39 degrees for these sorts of ranges up here. The world record is way up here. Uh, World-class performance above 20 meters. Again, you're looking at uh, angles in the high 30 to low 40 degrees. So it's a different type of problem if you were thinking about long jumping, the same type of principles uh, would hold. People often imagine that if you long jump and you take off at 45 degrees, this is going to give you the maximum distance you could possibly long jump. Nobody can run in at 10 meters per second and launch into the air anywhere near 45 degrees. So the takeoff angles are much, much lower. You know, maybe 10, 11, 12 degrees or something like that. No one is strong enough uh, to achieve a launch angle greater than that with those types of horizontal running speeds. So in many of these uh, events that involve throwing things or running and launching yourself, it's not a pure unconstrained projectile problem. There is a link between the launch speed and the launch angle that determines what the ultimate or optimal performance is. Well, last example, um, we're going to look at things like this rather later on in the uh, lecture series, uh, about what happens when you apply power in an event and there's a number of people doing it. 
And the classic example uh, is rowing. Of course, one can do this for canoeing as well. It's probably more interesting there, but let's look at rowing, uh, this example. So if we have a boat with a number of oarsmen in it, um, then how does the speed which the boat can achieve depend on the number of rowers? And you will see there's a sort of catch-22 here because if you add more rowers, you get more power to move you along, but you're adding more weight to be moved. So what's the winning effect? And uh, if a boat moves through the water, the drag on the boat from the water is proportional to the speed squared, and it's also proportional to the area of the boat's surface that's in contact with the water. So it's a classic sort of resisted motion, uh, well, the surface area of the boat is going to be proportional to some length squared, sort of radius of the curvature of the hull, and the volume of the boat will be proportional to the cube of that length. So it's our same issue. This is proportional to an area, this to a volume, and this volume will also be proportional to the number of members of the crew. Because if you want to fit them in, okay, you want to double the number of crew members, you've got to sort of double the length of the boat to fit them in. So the drag on the boat, proportional to v squared l squared, uh, is proportional to v squared times n to the two-thirds. Okay? So as you pack more people on the boat, this is how the drag force increases. But what about the power? Here are our rowers. Well, if you've got n people sweating away, uh, and each of them applies a power P, let's assume they're all the same uh, in terms of strength, then the total power will be the number of rowers, N times the power that any one of them applies. And that's got to be the power uh, which overcomes the drag. Okay? Well, if you want a power from a drag force, multiply the force by the velocity, so it's V cubed times N to the two-thirds. So we've got now a relation between n, v, and n to the two-thirds. v cubed is proportional to n to the third. v is proportional to n to the ninth. So the speed that the boat will go does indeed increase as the number of rowers increases, but not very fast. It goes as the ninth power of the number of oarsmen. If you add a cox, the amusing little thing to do, if I assume my, my cox is a third of the weight of a rower, um, it's a slight variant because you're adding someone who you've got to fit in, he's got to be towed along, but he's not adding any power. Just sort of verbal power, maybe. So the formula just changes a little bit uh, with our third of a, of a person there. If we look at the 1980 uh, Olympic races, um, you get a, a beautiful fit to that formula. Um, so here's the, uh, the single, uh, it's a skull, okay, and he's one, here's the pair, the four, the eight. These are the times in seconds, okay. Uh, if you um, have a cox, okay, you can see when you have two, adding the cox really increases the time, adding the four increases the time, so... This is almost exactly what our last formula <coughs> predicts. Okay, so adding the cock slows you down, uh, even though he may be uh, helping you in certain ways uh, steer a, a true course or, or, or screaming uh, at you to go faster. So if you want to go in a straight line, you're better without one. If you're in the boat race, it's essential because you're going around curves. You really need to steer. So this simple scaling formula tells you how over two kilometres, uh, the winning time has this rather definite trend, which fits this n to the ninth rule rather well. OK, last thought for the day. We've, we've mentioned weight classes. One of the great paradoxes of sport is that we do indeed have uh, weight classes uh, in events like boxing and weightlifting and wrestling and, and judo uh, for obvious reasons. But there is a collection of other events which are equally reliant upon pure strength where there aren't. So there are no weight classes in shot put or hammer. There are none in Olympic rowing or there are in other categories of rowing. So there's a, 
a lightweight crew competition, for example, the lightweight uh, boat race. Uh, but there are no weight categories in these events. And so you can see what happens. Okay, if you are, a, uh, if you are five foot tall, uh, you don't become a shot putter. And all shot putters tend to become larger and larger and larger. Uh, it's a self-selecting bias. So uh, you could argue it's a rather good case to have weight categories uh, in shot put and other heavy strength events. Also, if you're thinking along that line, I remember I gave a talk in Loughborough the other week at the High Performance Centre in the Mathematics Department, and somebody came up to me afterwards in the audience and said he was a basketball player, uh, you know, and what could I recommend to improve you know, his jumping and so forth. Well, the first thing that struck me about him was he was about the same height as me. So I recommended that he grow much taller. Um, so, so it occurred to me that, that basketball might become a much more interesting sport, at least at the participatory level, uh, if there were height classes uh, for teams. So you would, have, uh, you would have a competition where nobody can be above seven feet tall, nobody can be above six foot six tall, and so on. Uh, and uh, in the high jump, for example, you might wonder whether... Uh, tallness really is uh, an advantage, interesting question. Uh, most high jumpers, with just one or two exceptions in men's, uh, uh, Jacobs and uh, the 19 uh, uh, Hull, are the two uh, world-class high jumpers who are just of ordinary height, okay, 181 or something. But pretty much they're very tall, uh, moving towards two metres or so in height. So, for some reason, we have developed weight categories in some sports that reflect the fact that strength grows like that two-thirds power uh, of weight and it grows like the square of size. But we've decided not to apply categories of weight or height uh, into other events for reasons that are uh, not really obvious. Okay, that's all for today. I'm happy to try and answer questions if you have any. Thank you. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.